Thank you very much. So I will try to follow the tradition of making an applied mathematics talk that people can follow. So let's, let's hope for the best. So today I want to talk about non-interpenetration in, in films. And I would like to say that this is a very long-standing collaboration with Martin, who is also in the audience. We have been th uh, thinking about this topic for quite some time and still not very satisfied <laughs> with what we found. So I will just at least present you what we know and what we don't know. And um, yeah, let's see what comes out. So let's start very easy. So what do I mean by the, by the title of the topic? So what, what, I mean, what does it mean, non-interpenetration for thin films? I mean, we've come along this word non-interpenetration for quite many talks already before, so I just copied a picture from this very old paper by Pans, with which I will be referring to at some point. And this is what happens here is exactly what we don't want to happen. I mean, this is interpenetration. So you have your solid body, which looks like this, and then you deform it somehow, and then accidentally it just went through itself. So this is what you don't want to happen, because physically, if you think about what you uh, experience from your daily life, so there have been many experiments, so I have to somehow also make an experiment, so I will try and later. Um, so what you think from your daily life, this, is, this, is, this, is, this should be somehow forbidden, right? So in our mathematics, we need to formulate the models in such a way this is never going to happen. Well, in thin films, what are thin films? So here are some examples. So, I mean, this is some solar uh, kind of um, cells. This is maybe some actuator. This is maybe also some kind of solar cell. And this is my favorite application. This is a sheet of paper, which everybody of you has. So we can make an experiment, all of us, right? Okay, so uh, those are thin films. And I would like to understand what it means, non-interpenetration in exactly this geometry, when one of the dimensions is zero, say zero. Okay, so this is our mathematical idealization, it's, it's really zero. Okay, and before I do that, I have to start somewhere, and uh, I start in the bulk. So I start in a three-dimensional object, so something like a really, Stand ahead, this this phone here somewhere. But you can think of like, oh, it's here, <laughs> perfect. So it's like a solid three-dimensional object, and there's where I want to start because there the situation is much more clear in a way, even though it's not even clear there. Okay, so let me just state the problem. So I want to stay in the purely static case, no evolution here. I want to minimize something. The thing I minimize is, is, the, is the stored energy. In my case, it depends on the gradient, and it also depends on the second gradient in order to make things more smooth. But the traditional setting is that the second gradient is not here, not there. I mean, that, that's the better setting. And I minimize it on a set, and this set is the set of admissible deformations. So I have to think about what the admissible deformations can be, and this is quite clear. I mean, if you look into your favorite book of mechanics, you will find what the set of deformations should be. So, okay, so this is what I already said, and this is also what I already said, so let's go to the set of deformations. So just, just in order to, to say that this set of deformations is somehow a part of the model. So in putting something to the admissible set on which I minimize, I can change the model in a way. I mean, it, it's different what I can do. So let me just concentrate on what the set of deformations should be. And if you don't know, then I mean, or I don't know, then I can open uh, any favorite book of classical mechanics. I, I just choose, for example, the one of CLA here, but you could take any. And then you will read what it should be. I mean, a deformation is a vectorial mapping. Okay, it's smooth enough. Okay, okay, whatever. But then it comes. It should be injective, except perhaps on the boundary. So I mean, a, def uh, a, a suitable deformation is an injective mapping. That's what it should be, and that's an important assumption that, that we should have. And this is actually the assumption that tells you that there is no uh, interpenetration. Because if the mapping is completely injective, it could have never crossed itself, it could have never gone through itself. So non interpenetration means somehow injectivity. This is well known in the bulk. But let me just uh, make a spoiler alert. It's important that it's except perhaps on the boundary. 
So on the boundary, it's allowed to, to be non-injective. Okay, and it should be also orientation preserving, but this is somehow the same thing set again. Okay, so let me just say that again. So when we are working with deformations in the bulk, the non-interpenetration is very well known. It can be found in classical books, and um, it should uh, be, and it should correspond to injective mapping. So at least we have a very well set problem. That doesn't mean that we can solve it, but at least we have a problem that that is somehow set and that we know where we should work on. So. Let me just tell you how one usually copes with uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a model in order to get this elastic in order to get this injectivity. So for local injectivity, one usually says, okay, so I, I take my energy in such a way that it's plus infinite if the Jacobian is say not not positive. Okay, so if I put this, I somehow force that uh, any 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 fun, I mean any deformation of finite energy here will have a positive Jacobian, and if I'm in a very smooth case, say, and this is a very smooth case, then this means local injectivity. Okay, and if I want, I mean this is perhaps good, but this is not good enough because a, a material could be perfectly locally injective and still very far away, it, it could cross. So. So what I really need is I need global injectivity, and what I can do is, Stand already mentioned, I can put injective boundary conditions everywhere on the boundary, then I'm somehow safe. But this is perhaps not what we want to do because, I mean, if I control the whole shape, this is perhaps not what I want to do. So uh, a very a popular condition is the Cialenecha's condition, which is just the area formula and which tells you, okay, uh, under some smoothness, and if the Jacobian here is positive, the napping here is one-to-one. -one. In my case, it's one-to-one. -one. And if I put the second gradient away, it's one-to-one -one almost everywhere. Okay? So this is a very popular setting, and I just want to remember you, I, I want, just want you to remember this so that we can see if we can learn from this something also for our thin film setting or not. Okay? So let me just mention as a side remark that even, okay, everything looks very clear and everything looks uh, like very well formulated and it looks like there is no problem there, but just to acknowledge the amount of uh, work that has been done also by the people in the audience, this is, uh, this is a problem, uh, or the injectivity problem is very far from having a good solution in elasticity. So let me just say that uh, there has been a set of open problems in elasticity by Ball 20 years ago, and it stands still. So, um, and that tells you, okay, so if I, if I somehow cross out the second gradient, I do not have any regularizations, and I know the minimum, I, I usually know about this, uh, about this energy here, so that it's quasi-convex, and it has the right growth, so it blows up whenever the Jacobian goes to zero. Can I prove that there are minimizers or can I not? I mean, that's completely open. Um, it's something where there have been very scattered results and none of them is really good. So it's very hard to say, even to make a relaxation under this constraint is something which is, is still completely open and so on. So let me just uh, make a remark why this is so, I mean, okay. So let me just say we could uh, think that, okay, so if it's so hard, we just skip it, right? We make energies which don't have this growth and then we are satisfied, everything is great. But um, this is not a good idea because injectivity is important. Okay, you can think of it that maybe, I mean, it's, a f it's, it's written in the physics book, so you can say it's important because it's in the physics books, but it has another meaning also. There are applications where you um, have to transfer between the current and the deformed configuration, and that happens usually when there is some interaction between elasticity and other effects. So one of the effects is fluid structure interaction, which we have seen already in the, in the, on the first day by Sebastian. And all magnetoelasticity, this is exactly the same thing where you have to transfer. And then injectivity is something which you really need to have. So it's like forced by the model, it, you, it cannot be done otherwise. So it's important to consider it. 
And let me just say what is behind the curtain. I mean, why is there an open problem, which at that time has been open, it's 20 years, still open. So maybe in 20 years, it's still open. So, so why is this? I mean, why is it so hard? And if one would like to prove existence of minimizers under this growth, at some point, okay, so the invertibility constraint is strongly non-convex, this you can believe me, but at some point this becomes a problem because, as uh, Stefan was considering, we need to make a cutoff. So we have some, some sequence of functions here, we have something on the boundary, and we need to match it in, a, in some way. And there is a very popular way how to make a cutoff by convex combinations, which of course destroys the injectivity and the invertibility immediately. So this is not what you want to do. So there has to be some other way how to make these cutoffs, and there are no good ways, at least known to me so far. So this can be a little bit circumvented because uh, maybe it's easier to make the cutoff on like lower dimensional objects, maybe like lines or something like this. But then you should have like extension theorems which help you to, to make it to the whole gray area. And as we have heard, this is a problem of its own and it's more not known than known. So um, it is also connected to the problem of approximations which we have seen and which many have in the audience worked on. So um, yeah, so I think that's the reason why it still stands and probably it will stand for some time still. Okay. And let me just make another remark about the CLN Etchers condition, which is a very popular condition in order to uh, enforce global injectivity. So, um, in fact, again, in the first gradient setting, if we have the CLN Etchers condition, it tells you that we have injectivity only almost everywhere in the deformed configuration. Almost everywhere seems like very good, but in fact, it's maybe not, because uh, this here is injective almost everywhere in the deformed configuration, and it's still interpenetrative. So it's a difference of being injective almost everywhere and of being solid homomorphisms. This, this is not the same. And uh, what we want in elasticity, we, we want the second. So this is an example which goes back to Pons, and he advocated the idea that, that maybe one should not work with this CLN just condition, and one should have other conditions, and I will just come back to him. Okay, and this is maybe also, so you see that this <coughs> interpenetration here happens on a lower dimensional set, but our, our film is a lower dimensional set. So maybe it tells me that if I go to thin film structures, the CLN just condition will not be the thing I want to have. And this will exactly be what it turns out, so let, let's see. Okay. So that, as I tried to say, that, that the, for the situation in the bulk is perhaps complicated, but it's um, at least there we have a clear path where we want to go. I mean, we have a definition what non-interpenetration means. We can open some classical textbooks, we know that what, what we want to prove, and it's a different story that we cannot do it, but at least we have a, a clear path what we want to prove. And in the thin film structures, we have not even that. I mean, if one uh, opens, for example, a classic book by Siale, there is nothing written there of what it should mean to be non-interpenetrative. So somehow we have to come up with a definition and um, yeah, so I will tell you what we've come up so far, but okay. But what is clear that injectivity is not the right notion. Okay, so why is that? So uh, I have to follow the tradition of making experiments. It has been said, so now I have to go on with this. So if I have my favorite thin film and I just fold it like this, then of course, I mean, due to the fact that, it's, uh, uh, that it doesn't have any dimension in this case, it's completely non-injective on the area where it touches. Because touching means it goes to the very same place. So it's non-injective. So, and that's definitely something which is admissible. I mean, it's admissible to touch for a thin film, so injectivity is definitely not the right notion. On the other hand, what we don't want 
for the thin film to happen is that it somehow goes through itself. So that I take scissors, make a hole, put it through, this is not what I want. So we have to find a notion which allows this, but forbids this. So this is uh, important. Uh, let me just say that the that, uh, Sierra Neches condition or a scaled version of it is not the thing which will help me. So why is that? So if I have the Sierra Neches condition, and if I in some say, um, if I scale it down to two dimensions, I come up with something like this. I mean, it, it's very natural. So the Jacobian scales to something like the normal along the film because uh, the normal being non-zero is what tells me something about local invertibility in the thin film, and this is just the area. So what this tells me is that the, f that the film could, should not have any non-injectivities, or if it has non-injectivities, they should be on a one-dimensional line, so, or, or, or a lower dimensional, so that they are not seen by this measure. But um, this is not in accordance with what I wanted, because if I fold, I have non-injectivities on a very large area, say two-dimensional, and if I go through, it can be that the non-injectivities are just on a one-dimensional line. So this, this, this doesn't tell me anything. So this definitely is not going to be the right path. So the natural counterpart of this CLNHS condition, it forbids touching, but it allows interpenetration, so this is not what I want. So then, if you talk to physicists or engineers, they will tell you a thin film never exists. So this is how the story is told. A thin film, I mean, it's always at least some atomic layers, so it's always a bulk. A thin film never exists, so perfect. So this is a good answer, but not a satisfactory <laughs> answer, I feel. But it can help you in a bit, because um, if thin films are always somehow derived from a bulk, and there is always some bulk behind them, then uh, this bulk definitely, at least this mid-plane of this bulk, is always at least some injective, um, say, map, okay, or so some in, uh, injective deformation. So I can always, let me just make an image. <coughs> so if I have my thin film, so let's think it's this, I mean, it's just rot now, so it's, it's a thin rod in two dimensions. So I can always think of it, okay, it should be like something thicker. And this thicker thing, well, however it deforms, maybe it touches also. But inside, I have this one plane which is always injective. So I could say, okay, so if I make it thinner and thinner, this plane will always be there. So perhaps the right thing is to say that the admissible deformations of thin films are just a closure of injective functions. Okay, so maybe I should really cho uh, choose um, injective functions like these midlines, and then I should make a closure, and this is what is admissible in the thin films. This is not very explicit, but let's think this is a good definition. But then if, if, if I say closure, then you will immediately ask uh, what kind of closure. I mean, there can be many. So which one is the right? And uh, what I propose, so what we propose is a closure is, uh, so let's not look at this definition uh, very much, but let's say, okay, we say that the deformation of a thin film will be non-interpenetrative or will be admissible if it's either injective, that would be the easy case, or if it's not ejective, then let's say it's in the closure of injective functions, and here we take the C1 alpha closure, or better, the weak closure of W2P functions, which we work on. Okay, it would be maybe even better to have here the C0, that would be my favorite, but let's, let's, let's put it here. Okay, so in a sense, we say that because we work in the second gradient setting, the admissible deformations, let's say that they are the weak uh, W2P closure of injective function. Okay, so that could be my definition. And uh, exact, uh, um, actually something like this is also in this paper by Pant. And in a way, th those are two engineers, so they say something similar, I will just come to this. But um, then you say, 
maybe, I mean, okay, that sounds nice, a reclosure, also good for making calculus of variations, but then you say, wait a moment, this cannot be correct, because um, this thin film should have been somehow, it should have come from a bulk. And if it should come from a bulk, like scales like this, so this is a bulk and scales and scales and scales, then of course I should, what I should calculate is a gamma limit, right? So this, this would be the appropriate tool. I should start with a bulk energy, I, could cal I should calculate the gamma limit, and I should arrive at my non penetrative deformations because the energy is finite only there. But if I do that, then okay, so now I, I put the definition of the gamma limit, which I think most of you have seen something like a million times, but uh, if somebody not, then let, let's look at this. It has, uh, the, the gamma limit tells me that I always have to find two ingredients, the lower bound for which this weak closure is a very good thing, because I mean, it goes well with this if I take a, if I take, um, a weakly converging sequence of, say, my minimizers or whatever, then I take the limit and it goes very well with this. But I also have to find a recovery sequence. And finding, finding a recovery sequence means, in a way, that, I can, that the weak limit is not enough. So in fact, I should be able to approximate my uh, non-interpenetrative deformations in a strong sense, because otherwise I will have trouble calculating this recovery sequence. So, because it asks for a, for a convergence of energies, so this, I mean, more or less, asks for strong convergence. So let me just highlight to you why I would really want that my non-interpenetrative deformations should be in the strong closure respect to W2P for, um, well, from these injective functions. So, uh, how, would I how would I construct this recovery sequence? So if I um, already have some injective deformation, say, so, so I'm lucky and I, and I have this, I, I need to construct this recovery sequence Y epsilon, I already have this Y zero, and let's say this is already injective. So I'm in a lucky situation, then what, what do I do? I mean, it's a very standard setting. In order to um, reconstruct this bulk deformation, I take my deformation of the thin film. I know that there is some neighborhood around it. This is called the, uh, the tubular neighborhood, where it's still injective, where I have the freedom to move into. And uh, so I choose epsilon small enough so that I'm in this neighborhood. And I take the normal here and I just extend by the normal, okay? And this will still give me an uh, injective deformation, and this will give me somehow a recovery sequence like I would like to construct it. So let me just say that this work of these two engineers which I cited, they, they take exactly this as a definition. They say, okay, so my thin film is, um, has an admissible deformation if for some fixed epsilon, this here is uh, a non-penetrative deformation in the bulk. Okay, so this can also be kind of a definition, maybe it's even correct, I don't know. But um, this is what I would like to do. So, but then it can happen that my film is folded, then my tubular theorem doesn't hold because I mean, I don't have the freedom, it's completely on it. So what I need to do is I need to approximate it by injective functions so that I push a little bit apart and then I can put there uh, the normal in order to get the recovery sequence. So and the question is if this can be done. So, um, and, and we have a positive answer, at least in some cases. So in order to, to, make, <laughs> to make the cases where we can to do something a little bit easier, uh, we now um, go back from 3D to 2D so we consider just planar rods, so 1D objects in 2D, so just curves. So my thin film is a curve now. I consider them in W2Q. I consider them here, this is like the local non-invertibility. I consider even some growth of the inverse so that it's a little bit bounded. And this here there is some control which uh, Stefan will recognize because it gives me something. It gives me the Billipschitz property at least. Okay, so this is the set of deformations I would like to consider. And with this, I, I have the following uh, proposition. 
that if I have a non-interpenetrative function in this set, then I can approximate it strongly in W2Q by injective function, at least if I have some technical um, conditions here, which I will just explain in a moment why I need them and why, they are, why I cannot do it otherwise, at least for the time being. Okay, so this is like what we would like to prove. The problem is that um, uh, the idea that my non-interpenetrative functions are a weak closure of injective ones is a very, I mean, it's non-specific, it's not anything that I can work with, right? So I need to find something else. I need to find something else for which I at least have something how I can work with. And so the idea is that non-interpenetration actually should correspond to something like non-crossing. So the function should have not crossed through itself. So how do I, how do I define non-crossing? So this is a picture, but uh, you know, there will be a definition, but it's scary. So let, I will put it only later. So what does it mean, uh, non-crossing? So here is my, my rod, and this one has crossed. So how can I know that it's crossed? Because it can be more complicated like here that they are going together for some time and then they cross, right? So, so I cannot make a local condition really. So what I do is I construct a tubular neighborhood around some injective interval, which is this one. So this is my tubular neighborhood. I have some mapping which will be called Psi from really some interval a, b, and this is, will be called beta, and this will be called minus beta. And we have this, we have this mapping psi, I can map uh, whatever comes from the film from some other parts. So I can map something like psi to the minus one of y, of some other interval CD, okay? So, so this is something which is not what I'm mapping here, this is not what I'm constructing this tubular neighborhood, but it's from some other interval and I map it back. So, and what does it mean that there is a crossing? It means that if I map it back in this rectangle, uh, this image has positive and negative values. It takes both. I mean, it goes through the y, it goes through the x-axis, and it takes in a second variable positive and negative values. So that's exactly what happens here. I just separate with my film this neighborhood into two parts. Here, I separate it by this tubular neighborhood, like the positive and negative, uh, like the positive and um, uh, negative values. And if I'm just in one part, then I have not crossed. And if I'm in both parts, then I have crossed. So this is, this is what tells me that I have crossed. And actually, the, you can make that even more complicated using like topological degrees or something. This is found in the paper by Obermann and Runa who, who proved that if you are in the crossing, then you could have never approximated by an injective deformation. Okay, in, uh, so, it never comes from an injective deformation. Okay, so I have this non-crossing property, and if I know that I have not crossed, this tells me that I will be able to pull the film apart. Okay, so let's, I will come to this a bit more, but let's, let's see this. So this, is the very de so this is the definition, which is a bit scary, you have the tubular neighborhood, so let's just jump to it. Okay, but in fact, so it seems like that this could be a very good definition because it's much more explicit. I know it's cross, non-cross, so this could help tell me, okay, maybe this is um, something which is equivalent to non-interpenetration so that I can work with this because it's much more explicit. But it's not, or at least for our, we haven't found, because uh, the film can make something like this. It's, we call it the rolled carpet. So if you think of your carpet and it's completely rolled, I will do the experiment. So this is my thin film and it's completely rolled. So it works like this. And every point here 
is a point of non-injectivity. Right, so in the film, every point is a, film, is a point of non-injectivity, and there is no crossing. And if we roll a lot of times, and then we either are fine or either cross, our definition cannot tell. Because it's very difficult, because we don't have any two intervals for which we can construct this tubular neighborhood, so it's somehow not possible to really tell. So we know that uh, if we are non-crossing, uh, so a crossing deformation is always interpenetrative, but talking about the opposite is not that easy. And that's why we have these technical conditions so that we can somehow go back to the crossing property. Okay? So let me just make this very easy. So if I have, say, this condition that between every two points of non-injectivity, I have some point where my film is injective, so it's really just the bending, or just uh, putting a film on it, then I will be able to work with the non-crossing property. So how do I do that? It's actually very easy. I'm in the situation where I have not crossed because it's a uh, non-interpenetrative deformation, so in the situation above, not in this one. Well, and then I can pull apart a little bit into the area where I have space. I know that I will not do anything wrong there, and I will obtain the injective modification. So there can be also layers, so that I can, I mean, it goes back, 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 so can I have layers? But then, because of that, that we are in the second gradient setting, there will be finitely many, so I can start with the upper one, and then just go one by one. So I have, I mean, I cannot start with the wrong one, that would not be good, but if I start with the most upper one, I will somehow make everything up correctly. And here it's important that uh, we have a lower bound on the derivative and can refer to uh, Stefan's, uh, Stefan's uh, result so that we know that the film is locally delicious. Okay, and, okay, and, and if in, in the other condition, at least if we know that on the beginning of the film we are non-interpenetrative or injective, then we can start from this beginning and starting pulling apart so that we really, again, obtain this injective modification. So I don't want to put any more details because I think that would be too much. So let me just put a but. So maybe this is a correct way, right? Maybe one should really think about these closures of injective functions, at least for the film, it seems very natural. Maybe even in the bulk, it would give the right result, as, as Pans is showing by his example. But it's not explicit. I mean, if somebody gives me uh, the formation, I, am very, I have a very hard time to say if this is admissible or not. And this is, this is quite of a problem because, I mean, how can I do numerics or whatever if I, don't, if, I, if I have problems to decide if a function is even admissible or not? So this is something which I would call a very big open problem here, and um, I have no solutions. I just put it in there that it's like an open problem. I mean, so I have like three minutes still. I would just say that I have said nothing about the convergence of energies. Even though I, I talked all the time, about, or I said that there should be some gamma limit, but the energy somehow was not there. I got like completely forgotten. And that's because there is nothing to be found in the energy. So I, I expect, okay, we have the second gradient, this is the first gradient, but never mind, for the thin film, for the thin film, uh, or for scaling down to the thin film, there are many, many results starting from Raoult and Letret and many, many, many more. And it's always the same thing. You start here and you go to some quasi-convex envelope with our, say, second gradient. So there's nothing to be found in the energies except for the fact that our energy will only be finite on the admissible deformations, otherwise it will be infinite. But let me just say that, just, just, just a side remark, because I was very surprised to see this, so now I like to tell it to people, that if I consider this uh, very easy membrane regime, which is the most flexible one and it, which maybe makes most sense, because I can bend the easiest, maybe it would be easier in other regimes, maybe there I have no so, so much freedom, so in the penetration is not such a big issue, 
But in this uh, say easiest regime, I just scale down, and I it's very well known that uh, the gamma limit, okay, under p growth, whatever, is this quasi-convex envelope. But then we knew in the bulk that we have this very hard constraint that if the energy is infinite for for uh, negative or non-positive Jacobians, then this is kind of a hard thing, and we struggle with this all the time. I showed you both problem, but in the film somehow. This seems not to may have any impact. So if I take in the, in the bulk an energy which satisfies this, and I scale it down to the film, it's the very same result. Completely forgotten. Not there. So I was, I was like shocked to see this, and I thought, oh, this cannot be true. I mean, we struggle so much. And then in the film, it's not there. It's actually a result to Anza Hafsa and Maralina, but OK. And, and there is something between, behind that. And the thing behind that it is that if there is a dimension loss. So uh, to say, if I, have, if, if I have a function which comes from 2D and goes to 3D, like a thin film, there is an old approximation result by Gromov and Eliasberg, which tells me that it can be approximated strongly by locally injective functions. So if I can do that, then it's clear that this local injectivity has really no effect in the field. So what one really has to talk about are these global effects, and maybe they should be somehow found by disclosure. So let me just uh, make some take-home messages. So it seems, at least from what we have found so far, that injectivity and non-penetration is, is not the same thing in the thin film, and maybe you should rather maybe talk about closures, and we should talk about global non-interpenetration, and yeah, so thank you for your attention.